wind is a fantastic technology. We live in one of the windiest places in the world here. And out of Europe, uh, Britain has 60% of the viable winter um, wind turbine sites in the whole of Europe. Like, it's a really windy place. But quite often those windy places are offshore or up in Scotland um, and not places where we tend to build our homes. So here we've got a, um, what did I say, it was 900 watt rated turbine. So what that means is um, it will produce 900 watts when the wind speed is about 12 meters per second. Now, the average wind speed in this country is about six metres per second. And probably today, I don't know, it's probably not more than two metres per second. So they have, wind turbines have like a cutting um, speed where after about two metres per second, they might start generating some electricity. But the curve, like the relationship between the wind speed and how much power you get from the turbine, is cubed so the curve sort of ex looks kind of exponential like that so at kind of one or two meters per second this will be generating god about sort of 20 watts if that and then as you get closer up sort of if you double the speed of the wind you more than double the amount of power you get out of it because of that cube relationship so they really lend themselves to really windy spots um, but if the wind speed isn't that high, then you really don't get very much out of them. So, what you, if you think you might live in a nice windy place where you, you think it might be a good idea to build one, the best thing is to test it, because the trouble with small-scale wind is about two-thirds of the turbines never pay themselves off financially, and they never pay off the environmental cost of making them. So you really have to test that it's an appropriate site. So what you do, you, you could get an anemometer, which is one of those things with little cups on that you get on weather stations. And you can get one of them with data loggers in for like a hundred quid, less than that. And so you, you, and you plonk it right on the site you think you want to put your turbine, that you think might be a good windy <coughs> site. And you, and you let it, log um, how long the turbine spends at each speed for over different seasons so it's a good idea to have it there at least over the windiest season of the year which is winter time um, and see how long it spends at each speed and then you combine that with so they come with this rated power curve saying how much power it gets at each speed and then you combine that curve with what comes out of your data loggers and you see how much power am I actually going to get based on how much wind I get here. And it's quite a simple calculation to do and you see whether it's actually worthwhile getting one. Uh, and, and in most cases, I have to say it's not because these need um, a big smooth site with no obstructions. You can see the trees are higher than the turbine here mm. and any... Um, any sort of obstruction <coughs> within quite a significant um, distance causes turbulence and they don't, because the, the, these horizontal axis turbines, so that's when the, the axis is like that, they're tracking the wind and every time they're tracking the wind they don't produce any energy. So a lot of the time it's not actually producing energy, it's just kind of tracking the wind and then get you know take a little while to get up to speed so it's particularly bad like if you're touching to buildings like say in london you see a lot and there's loads of turbulence and there's loads of obstructions around and they don't actually get much wind it's the kind of thing like that david cameron did didn't they when he uh, became prime minister i think he put one on his house i don't know if it was on number 10 and then he's taken it off again now because it doesn't work it's one of those things you think, like, uh, oh, I'm going to be green, I'll get a wind turbine, they look good. Um, but actually, in a lot of cases, they don't work on small scale. The, so if you, if you think you might be near a good windy site, it's best to club together and get a big community one. 
because they also lend themselves to being big. If you imagine, so the amount of power that you get out of a turbine related to its size is squared. So what's, what's the um, area of a circle? Pi R squared, yeah. So R being the radius is, is the length of one of the blades of that turbine. So the total area that those blades cover is called the swept area. So the relationship between the swept area and how much power you get out of it is <coughs> squared because of pi r squared. So if you imagine you had like five of us all thought, yeah, I want to get a turbine. Uh, we're going to have five little earth ships in the middle of Brighton, five little turbines. The swept area of five circles the area that's covering is smaller than of one big yeah. one. Do you see what I mean? So you get less power out of it because it's covering less area. Not only that, it's got to be cheaper as well to just get one big one. Yeah. It's the less materials. So that's, and, and like in Denmark, I think about 40% of the turbines they have there are community owned. Yeah, so it's where people, in Denmark there's just loads of them, they're everywhere. Yeah, and people are into it and like, landowners let it happen and and it's just a fantastic way of generating electricity all clubbing together and you know you're like well that hill over there looks pretty windy let's speak to the farm who owns it club together and get a turbine and put it up there so that's with wind you just have to really pick your spot carefully and think about you know is it going to be better if we get a community turbine so you're saying the average wind speed in britain like six was it six Miles, meters, meters per, per second. second. What would what would like be a decent rate for you to think it's worth putting up a wind turbine? What would we, is there a figure or something? Well, um, so like with solar panels, yes. the the um, you know it being sixty watts or hundred watts or whatever, it's like they're rated to standard test conditions. So that means the same across the board. Yeah. With turbines, they're not. Right. So a 900 watt turbine <coughs> could produce that at 11 meters per second right. or 13 meters per second. Okay. So ideally, you need to be in a site that's as close to that as possible. But, so you can kind of like Google what's the average wind speed for my area and you can get maps with it all over. But it's so, it's so particular to an individual site, you know, what it is here, the average wind speed is different from what it is right next to that hedge over there. So you just have to <coughs> measure it for your site. Um, but yeah, sort of at least... So even in Britain, solar would probably be more effective than wind? Yeah. On a domestic, domestic dwelling, generally. Unless you're up like in Scotland yeah. or on East, the coast somewhere. East Anglia, we have a lot, there's a lot of... Yeah. Yeah, it's sort it's, of... We are flat with no trees. Lincoln's so that's the only good thing. Yeah, on the yeah. east, expo there's nothing between you yeah. and Russia, basically, is there? <laughs> um, Denmark. <laughs> it gets good yeah. wind speeds there. Um, so, yeah, you get a lot of wind around the coast and <laughs> when there's not sort of many obstructions. But here, so maybe right down on Brighton coast, it might be worth yeah. it, I don't okay, know. Down. How much would this little turbine Thing. What kind of price would that? I'm not actually yeah. sure, but I think they are more expensive per watt for, than solar. And really, in this scenario, yeah, are, it just would never ever be worth. You can yeah. actually do <coughs> courses like build your own turbine. I suppose if if you're building your own, then it's got a lower embodied energy and a lower cost, yeah. which makes it more worthwhile. It mm -hmm. makes it like, well, you know. Uh, nine times out of ten, it's not worth it. But there's times in the year where there's no sun mm. and lots of wind, and and it's good. It's you know you think for my scenario, it's worth it just for that. If you're next to a stream, can you get a uh, turbine in the stream. It? That's so a hydro, isn't it? Yeah. Hydro is it's another one that in the ideal scenario, it's good. But what you need is what's called a good head. Heel, yeah. So a good slope on yeah. your stream. You need Quite a lot of water, but you really need like at least a meter drop. Does that happen? Not at, does that, depending on the land, but I mean, do things exist for that on a domestic level? Yeah, so like yeah. in Wales again, there's loads. Yeah, well, like there used to be a lot of micro hydro, and then there's some sort of a law came in from the Environment Agency that 
to, uh, you're basically using that water and putting it back in the stream so you have to get permission from the environment agency or even a license i'm not sure to use microhydro because you're kind of borrowing the water um, and that meant loads of plants shut down in Wales. But yeah, basically, yeah, if you're in a hilly area with a stream, then the it hydro is just quids in, yeah. you know, like I stayed. And it can be effective, like efficient. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's brilliant because it, one thing about it is constant, more constant than the sun or, yeah. the, <laughs> um, or the wind. Like I stayed in a place. Um, in the Pyrenees and they had it there you know quite a fast flowing very steep <coughs> stream and they had like electric heating just the, like electric everything everywhere because there was just so much power from the hydro and it's so constant so you, you don't need as big a batteries because you've got this like constant flow of free energy and it increases in need... the winter What's that? And it would increase in oh, yeah. potentially exactly. yeah. freeze yeah. depending where it is. Well, Stuart Wood had a mini micro, but when we were there doing the Permi course, something happened to the water. There was hardly any water because they live on a hill, and that's like Devon. But you know, they've got little t a tiny turbine, uh, solar panels. They've got all they can think of, like little bits here and there. So one thing fails, <laughs> something else works. Yeah, and that it, you need backup. Yeah. And you need different things in your system, and mm. you, and quite often, everyone at one point or another falls back on a generator, or like um, I mean, times you need a generator. So say, you know, we talked about the maximum load on your inverter, but you might you know, need power tools. I mean, you're bound to use yeah. power tools mm. for building your building. Some of them are so powerful. I mean, ideally, you use the ones with the rechargeable batteries yeah. in, so you charge it up slowly off your power and you don't use it suddenly. But, you know, if you want to use, like, a circular saw or something, um, that uses a lot of power. So what some people do is just switch a generator on for those, those occasions rather than sizing up your system to cope with every possible scenario you go okay i'll have a small little system and a generator for those times when i need more all right like some people i know live on a boat and they you know they have their fresh juices every morning it's important to them as part of their lifestyle to have a freshly made juice so they switch on the generator just for the juice you know if you've got like a, a partner who simply can't live without their hair dryer for example he's like all right darling well go out you know switch on the generator plug it in there and you can have a hair dryer but that's what you have to do rather than sizing your system to cope with every single scenario um, 